Okay, let's begin. 200 miles uh, south of Bozeman, the Teton Range rises some 7,000 feet above the floor of Jackson Hole. And the Grand Teton itself soars nearly 1,000 feet above neighboring peaks. More than 100 climbing routes and variations from moderate to extreme have been established on the peak, but most would agree that even the easiest require some, sim <coughs> some climbing skills and roped protection. After repeated attempts in the 19th century, the first documented descent of the peak was finally accomplished in 1898. For 25 years following the ascent, the peak remained unclimbed until three summer school students at the University of Montana ventured forth in August 1923. In 1980, 57 years after their climb, I had the wonderful opportunity to visit with and record the remembrances of one of these students, Bozeman's David DeLapp. Shortly, you will hear DeLapp describe part of their climb in his voice. He met Quinn Blackburn and Andy DePiro through a university hiking group that summer. The three were already talking about doing a trip through Yellowstone in DePiro's Model T when Blackburn noticed a big mountain on the map south of Yellowstone and immediately suggested the three of them climb the Grand Teton. Their enthusiasm was matched only by their naivete. Now, this is just a, a vacation trip. We want to see the Yellowstone Park, and we want to see the country between here and there. And we allow one day to climb the Grand Teton. He says, that's all you need anyhow. These three were smart and very strong hikers, but they had no rock climbing experience whatsoever. No rope, no climbing equipment, knew nothing of Owen's route, and ominously would encounter ice-covered rock on the steepest, most exposed section of the peak. They were completely innocent. When the aspiring climbers arrived in the Tetons, they heard that professional mountaineers from the east were there preparing to attempt the second ascent of the Grand. It would be many years before DeLapp learned this group was supported by the National Park Service and led by Professor Albert Ellingwood, arguably the finest American climber of the day. Ellingwood's party had detailed information about the route, but they shared little of it. They did, however, tell the Montanans that Bradley Canyon provided the best approach to the peak. When DeLapp said they had only one day for the climb, some of Ellingwood's party were amused. <laughs> they camped near Bradley Lake and the next morning entered trailless Bradley Canyon. In scarcely six hours, they climbed 5,000 feet to the lower saddle, stopped for a baking sandwich, <coughs> bacon sandwich, then continued another 1,400 feet to the upper saddle, the point where all previous attempts but Owens had failed. Searching for a route through the vertical rampart above, Blackburn and DePiro explored south, while the lap deferred traversed north several hundred feet along the harrowing ice-covered ledge and onto the imposing west face where he could go no further alone. And I wiggled my way across there and climbed up on the ledge and I walked about 60 feet on the ledge. Then the ledge continued, but the rock above it was overhanging. The ledge was so narrow that half of my body overhung that fall. Retracing his route back to the upper saddle, DeLapp told his companions he may have found a way, then led them back across the harrowing traverse to the place where he had been stopped. So, Blackman took over, and I sure was glad that he did. He said, you two men stand here together, and he lay down on his back in that niche and let his legs below his knees hang down vertically at the edge of that lower end. He said, the lap raised the prayer up so he can get a hold of my feet. I lifted him up, he got a hold of his feet and climbed on over his body. Then Blackman got up and he said, the prayer, take off one pair of your trousers. And he took a pair off and the prayer held on to Blackman's feet and wedged himself into that niche 
Blackburn came down and held to the top to these trousers and let the legs of those trousers down to me so I could get a mother. And I twisted the legs of that pair of trousers and climbed that, and that's the only rope we had. Another, another hour and a half of climbing, and the summit of the Grand Teton was theirs. But it was getting late, and they faced the daunting task of descending the icy chimneys and traversing back to the upper saddle. Again, ingenuity and good luck saved the day. Blackman said at the left, take hold of the top of this rock and stretch yourself out as far as you can. De Piro, take hold of the left's legs just above his knees and let your body dangle down over the lower end to this rock. And Blackman climbed onto his body and swung himself in to catch this ledge. Then he said, the left turn loose and slide down into the arms of the peril. And that I did it without hesitation. I'll agree that I was quite, with, with a lot of anxiety, but I did it. And Blackman let us both slide down into his arms and set our feet right on that icy ledge. Now below the serious climbing, but in darkness, the Montanans descended 3,000 feet into Bradley Canyon to spend the night. By 9 a.m. the next morning, they were back at their Model T and headed to Missoula. Two days later, Albert Ellingwood and party, equipped with rope and gear, started from a high camp in Bradley Canyon. They were approaching the summit, certain they were about to score the second descent of the Grand. Then they saw the footprints in the summit snow. Those three Montana boys. <laughs> But as DeLapp said, one day's all we need anyhow. <laughs> Thank you.